Okay, well, thank you. Uh, thank you all for your patience. Um, yeah, 181 the Meridian. Let's just cut to the chase here. I think uh, Jim Reed kind of gave some of it away. Um, well, about 20 years ago, which was probably before COVID, um, I published Chaco Meridian, which was an argument that Chaco and Aztec and Pocky Mail had something to do with each other. Uh, they were sequential capitals, and they all happened to be on the same north south line. Now, in self defense, I have to say that the title of this book, Chaco Meridian, was the publisher's, uh, not mine. Um, maybe he thought he was going to get the New Age crowd. Uh, subsequently, there's a fair amount of stuff that's popped up uh, that made, actually made it worthwhile doing the second edition in 2015. That was a um, substantially different book. Uh, parts of it were the same, but uh, there's a lot of new material. It's the new material I'm mostly going to be talking about tonight. Um, Chaco Meridian covered about three, three centuries, uh, the 1999 version. Uh, the 2015 version is almost, almost a thousand years of history that I think is related by, positionally anyway, by uh, reference to that north-south line. So it started at Chaco Canyon, uh, with, for me, um, when, the, when I worked for the Park Service, one of my jobs, one of my several jobs was to study the architecture of the great houses out there. And these are, this is downtown Chaco, with Pueblo Alto. Pueblo Benito, Chetra Kettle. Uh, there's a half a dozen really big ones and a bunch more that are sort of middle in size. Um, the one sort of inescapable architectural conclusion from looking at the great houses is that there are two kinds of people living in Chaco. And I'm not the first person to notice that. Uh, people have picked up on this since the Treering dated and uh, Treering dating came in and they saw that places like Pueblo Benito, which you call a great house, were contemporary with these tiny little unit pueblos, which are normal people houses, across mostly across the canyon. And these are you know, muscle to the same scale. Mostly. And these little complexes are four or five unit pueblos, four rooms, four above ground rooms, and a pit structure, which people call a kiva, even though they shouldn't. Um, and that's what a normal family house was before Chaco, and during Chaco, and after Chaco. Normal people lived in those little unit pueblos. So who's living in the great houses? Uh, I think architecturally, and there's lots of other evidence to back this up, but you had two classes of people there. You did have two different kinds of people, literally, nobles and commoners, which uh, shouldn't be surprising since almost every agricultural society north of Panama in the 11th and 12th century had nobles and commoners. I mean, that, that was the, the default, not all of them, but most of them. Uh, in what's now the United States, you know, from coast to coast, you had uh, um, Shumash, uh, on the California coast, it's a hundred gallons. And uh, in, in Cahokia, in the Mississippi Valley, in, in uh, Calusa, over in Florida, again, hundreds of gathers. It definitely had nobles and commoners. And it would be kind of surprising if Chaco didn't. And the architectural evidence, I think, is unambiguous on this. They did. So the Chaco guys, the little guy on the left, are trying to live like Mesoamerican lords, nobles. Uh, I'm not going to go into all this, but they, they get stuff from Mexico. They get cacao, they get macaws, they get the fripperies and probably you know don't use them the same way that they're used in Mesoamerica because these guys are way out in the edge but that's what they're trying to be and that's probably what they were I mean there wasn't an international boundary at that point uh the real Mesoamerican no nobility might have kind of laughed at them if they ever showed up um down at Tula or someplace like that but that was the 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 uh um, like I say the default option for how society was organized at that time and that, that's what they did Chaco itself is the capital of a region uh, about the size of Ohio, uh, lined in the blue dashed line there. All little red dots and squares and circles of things are smaller great houses, about 200 of them scattered over this area. And each one of those is surrounded by a community of unit pueblos of normal people. Uh, there's not a lot of people in this region. It's a big region, uh, Ohio. Hmm. Uh, but, you know, max is probably 100,000 people here. Uh, so they're spread pretty thin. Yeah, let me mute myself. Uh, John Fritz, 1978, which is when I started to study these buildings, uh, late 70s, early 80s, um, published a, a very interesting paper, although people didn't like it at the time, pointing out that Pueblo Alto uh, on the uh, top of the mesas uh, to the north was due north of Sinfetzen, up on top of the mesas to the south. That's that red line, which isn't running you know, up and down, but it's, it's a north-south line in this oblique angle. Um, and John 
pointed out that, that most of the layout of the Central Canyon uh, was symmetrical around that north-south line. North-south is pretty important to them, and it, it shows up in the buildings as well. Uh, historically, I don't have time to get into that now, but but uh, in 78, he published this thing, and, and the field was not receptive to this sort of thing in 78, so it kind of went under the radar, but um, I kind of liked it. Um, it surfaces again when Chaco moves to Aztec, which most people accept now. They didn't back in 99, but they, most people accept that now. The dating, dating worked out just fine. Uh, Chaco moved uh, 50 miles north uh, to Aztec, and it linked itself to, Aztec linked itself back to Chaco with this north-south road called the Great North Road, which is a monument more than a, a road, although it's a, it's a transportation corridor as well. It has a few dog legs and things to, to uh, um, accommodate bad terrain. But pretty clearly, uh, yeah, this north-south direction was very important. That's where the new capital is going to be, was due north of Chaco on a nice little creek, which is where they should have built it in the first place instead of Chaco. Um, Aztec ruins, this is just one of several buildings, a half dozen big buildings in Aztec. Um, it was this, this Aztec West, as, uh, of the two main freight houses, was the single biggest construction event in Chaco's history. This isn't Chaco on the skids. This is Chaco at the height of its power for organizing labor, uh, logistics, and all that kind of stuff. Pueblo Benito is bigger, but it took them two centuries to build Pueblo Benito. Most of this building you're looking at went up in 10 years, and it's a big building. Okay, so into the nuts and bolts. In the Southwest, we use a thing called the Pecos classification or the Pecos system that was cooked up in 1927 or, or formalized 1927 uh, that tracks time. Uh, and the archaeologists in 27, this is before there's a lot of tree ring dating, saw these different periods uh, and they could all agree that yeah, things changed from one period to the next. And they could all pretty much agree on what those changes were. Not entirely, but pretty much. And eventually they got to put dates on them once they got a lot of tree ring dates. The system it goes basket maker three, Pueblo one, two, three, four, five, and I take some personal liberties with four and five here in the dating. Um, we don't need to worry about why basket maker three is basket maker three. Uh, you know, that's a long story uh, clouded in the past. It's part of the historical sequence. And all those dates are current year or, or, or AD dates. We're going to go through these dates a lot. I'll, I'll try and put little reminders or these stages, P1, P2, P3, P4, P5. I'll try and put little reminders of what those dates are on slides. But Chaco is good solid P2, 900 to 1150. I mean, the actual dates of Chaco is more like 850 to 11, 1120, but it's, it's in that slot. Where Aztec is good solid Pueblo 3, 1150 to 1300, although it actually starts earlier, 1110, and ends by 12, maybe 1275, 1280, but it's, it's in that time slot. Okay, so what about before Chaco? Um, Turns out <laughs> there's some really interesting sites that are also north south of each other before Chaco. Let's we'll start off with Basque Maker 3 in Shabikashi. Uh, oh, sorry, in these, these okay. Shabikashi, and in the following Pueblo 1 period, P1, Blue Mesa, Bridges Basin, and I'm going to talk about those. Uh, all in all, these, these three these sites, Chaco's P2, uh, Blue Mesa's P1. Um, Shabika Sheep Basket Maker 3 are stretched over about 80 miles north south and they're due north south of each other. Shabik, Shabika Sheep is a pit house village. Basket Maker sites aren't, don't have great houses. They have pit houses that uh, aren't terribly impressive to look at as sites because when a pit house collapses, it just leaves a divot. In the middle of this uh, uh, Basket Maker village, there's a great kiva, you know, what we call a great kiva, it's a big public facility. A regular basket maker site anywhere else in the southwest is one pit house or two pit houses, sometimes with a little stockade around them. You find a basket maker site with 10 pit houses, you know, you write a book and retire. At Shibikashi, which got excavated early and was, was presented as a typical basket maker site, is anything but. There's 100 pit houses at Shibikashi. Not all, not all occupied at the same time, but the archaeology, you know, whatever happened there archaeologically left 100 dead pit houses. Um, it's really something. There's nothing, nothing else like that in the Southwest, and it's a Chaco. As it turns out, it's not the only one at Chaco, all right? Uh, Shabikashi is down at the upper end of the canyon, lower, lower right. At the lower end of the canyon, upper left, is a site that's another 100 bit houses in a great kiva. It doesn't have a fancy name. It's just 29 SJ 423. Odds are underneath the later Pueblo Benito, uh, there's a big basket maker site. Every place they stuck a hole uh, beneath 
the Pueblo Benito Great House, they're a hidden basket maker. As Chip Wills has pointed out, there's basket maker all up and down the canyon. There's these 200 100 pit house sites, probably another big one in the middle. And then on every knob, there's one or two, the, the regular basket maker sites, one or two pit houses. Uh, and all this stretches nine miles. And there's nothing like this in basket maker three. All right, you take my word for it. This is what we call a fact in, in the business. Okay, that's followed by, okay, that was basket maker three. The next step is Pueblo one, P1, which is 700 to 900. Basket maker three is 500 to 700, nominally. Um, due north is Blue Mesa, which is just south of Durango. And the local uh, community airport is, over, you know, is built over a lot of this. But the guys that are Pueblo one aficionados, like Rich Wilshies, they knew that Blue Mesa was the single biggest Pueblo one site in, you know, anywhere in the Four Corners. Not enormously bigger, not orders of magnitude bigger, but it was the biggest. Everybody knew that. Okay, it's worth pointing out that at Blue Mesa, and what I'm about to talk about, Ridges Basin, there was no earlier Basket Maker 3, and there was no later P2. This is something that happens in a burst during the Pueblo 1 period. They decided to dam up. Uh, let me back up here. Okay, you see Basin Creek coming in. They decided to dam up Basin Creek and build a reservoir in Ridges Basin, in the ridges of the family that owned the ranch there. And of course, they had to do archaeology, uh, you know, ahead of the rising waters. And it turns out the Ridges Basin from one end to the other is Pueblo One. Uh, you know, yeah, I mean, <laughs> Blue Mesa and Ridges Basin, which is all one site, I mean, you know, they're, they're separated by a, I don't know, a half mile neck where, where, where um, Basin Creek goes through a bit of a little bit of a neuros. It's all one site. It's all one time period, including some really wild architecture that they found when they were doing the salvage excavations. This is Pueblo One, Ridges Basin. Uh, it's the 5LP245. They, they gave them all separate site numbers, but it's all one five mile long P1 site. It's just a little sparse, sparse on the ground. But at, at that site, whose name I've already forgotten, 5LP, whatever it was, they found towers. Nobody builds towers in Pueblo One. I mean, and huge pit structures that were unfortunately full of chopped up people. And, you know, just all sorts of esoteric and strange and sort of for Basket Maker 3, or excuse me, for Pueblo 1, monumental architecture. I went and visited them when they were digging this stuff. And they were showing me this, all this wild stuff, these towers and all these things. And I said, you know, to the guy that was running in charge, in charge where are we? He said, I was hoping you wouldn't ask me that because we're due north of Chetricatl in Chaco Canyon. Okay, so in Pueblo 2, it bounces back to Chaco. We've already talked about Chaco, right? Basket Maker 3 is at Chaco. Pueblo 1 is up near Durango. Back to, back to Chaco and Pueblo 2. And again, all these are due north south of each other. When I say due north south, I mean, give me a break. I mean, within a kilometer of that, of that, that line. They're, 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 yes, they're, for all intents and purposes, they're, they're due north south. And for Chaco, there has, there's a downtown region I showed you this Benito and Chetra Kettle and Alto and a bunch of other stuff. But the real action, stretches from Unavita on the upstream part to Penasco Blanco, which is right below uh, the, the big Basket Maker 3 village down at the lower end of the canyon, in six miles. Again, all three of these are stretched out over six, you know, six miles, five miles, whatever, of more or less continuous, not, not continuous settlement, I mean, it's, it's dotty, but, but uh, you know, there is settlement from one end to the other uh, of, of this length. So all three of them are linear, linear uh, settlements. Okay, how about after Chaco? Well, you already know what comes right after Chaco. Chaco's Pueblo two. In Pueblo three, you get Aztec ruins. And in Pueblo four, my Pueblo four, you get Paquime or Casas Grandes. And we'll end up really taking a leap down to Culiacan. Okay, so it starts off at Chaco with Shabikashi and the, and the Basket Maker three stuff. Then it bounces up to Blue Mesa and Ridges Basin and comes back down to Chaco during Pueblo two and back north again, not quite so far. Uh, 50 miles to Aztec. And all the, again, all these things are north south of each other. Aztec is, you know, the biggest site in Pueblo 3. There's nothing else like it. Um, with monumental architecture and, you know, uh, it, again, it's a capital. It's got a region. I'll talk about that in a minute. At the site of Aztec ruins, when they moved the capital there, at that site and for a few miles around it anyway, there was no Basket Maker 3. There was no Pueblo 1. There was no Pueblo 2. They, they got a site 
which was determined, I think, just by going north and you know, getting a nice creek and saying, this is the place, and built this city, it's a small city. Um, Aztec is, has great houses, which I said are among the largest construction events that Chaco ever pulled off, but it's, it's all about by walls and tri walls, uh, which are these, we don't know what these things are, uh, these circular concentric rows of rooms quite possibly with a tower in the center. So it looked like a wedding cake or something. And they're very, very central to the layout of Aztec rooms, just like that north-south line was at, at Chaco that John Fritz saw. Now it's, it's not oriented north-south, it's the end of a north line, but Aztec is not off, you know, its building's not oriented north-south. It's, they're developed with a grid, and this is John Stein figured this out, that goes between the by walls and the great kivas and has this, this is actually a quadra wall, the one in the middle, um, there's only one of those I know of. And then the, the solid red line is a chalk, the alignment of a Chaco road that again, you know, is an axis of symmetry around which they, they uh, laid this place out. And it's heading up uh, off to the upper left to another great house. It's up on the bluffs up above this thing. So this, this, this is big doing. Um, not as big as Chaco, not as successful as Chaco. Uh, Chaco had a big territory and it was peaceful and it rained, you know, they took the credit for it. Uh, they were fat times. And they moved to Aztec, starts off pretty well, but then the wheels come off. They have a drought and, and things don't work out so well for the, this new capital. You know, what would its region be? Well, I, it's, hard, it, it's a difficult question because they have, they have great houses, outlying great houses as well, but the minor nobility. But if we just look at where bywalls and triwalls are, uh, it gives you some idea maybe of, of what they consider their territory or the territory they considered them central. Um, most of these bywalls and triwalls are along the San Juan River, you know, Mesa Verde and places like that, but they're all the way down to Gallup in the south and, and uh, Ganada uh, over in the southeast corner. And of course, if you go back to Chaco again, so this is much reduced from the Ohio size of Chaco, but it's still considerable territory. Okay, after that, um, things were going bad, the wheels are coming off, it stops raining. Uh, there's, there's violence, um, the reason people move up into cliff palaces, and cliff dwellings, is not because they're nice places, but because they're scared. And like Sand Canyon on the lower left, these are normal people. These aren't great houses. These are normal people. These are unit pueblos, you know, nice unit pueblos. But they, they uh, gather together in walled villages with springs in the middle and towers, you know, bastions around the edge. And some of these places get sacked and burned. So, you know, things, Aztec is not able to make the railroads run on time. It's not able to keep the peace. And people leave, they vote with their feet. The, the commoners, they say, you know, <laughs> we gave you a few centuries, uh, you nobles, and it's you're screwing up and we're out of here. You ban them in the four corners, which by 1280 or so, um, everybody's gone. It's tens of thousands of people, which is really quite an unusual event. Uh, everybody's gone as far as archaeology can tell, at least. Uh, quite an unusual event in world history. And I think it was political. So yeah, everybody's leaving the Four Corners area, Mesa Verde in the, on the east and Cayenta on the west. These are archeological regions. And, and uh, heading south, heading to where the Pueblos are today, you see the word Pueblos there. Uh, there were already Pueblo people living there and so the folks move in with them. Uh, or some of them just keep on going. Uh, there are Cayenta sites down near Tucson. I worked on a Mesa Verde site down near Truth or Consequences, New Mexico. If you know where that is, it's practically in Mexico. Um, but by and large, they, they, they stayed where the Pueblos are today. And it's an interesting historical period. This is Pueblo 4, after 1300. After 1300, the Four Corners is empty. The Pueblos are still jostling. They're moving around a lot, uh, but more or less in that band uh, where the, the word Pueblos is there. And, you know, some of them are shooting further south, doesn't last long. They could either come back north or they keep going south. That's quite possible. I know the the nobles probably did, and that was the commoners. That's the commoners who were doing that. Uh, you don't have nobles after 1300 in the Pueblo world, and you don't have nobles in Pueblos today. They, they figured out ways to run, a, run a, town, a town, sizable town, without having kings and without having nobles, without having all that nonsense. They tried that before, and they remember this. They tell stories about it. They tried that. It ended very badly. They figured out ways to never do that again. But noble families are still noble families. I mean, they're different than regular people. It's their job is to be noble <laughs> and rule. Um, and I think that a bunch of them, you know, it's a couple hundred, went south towards Mexico, which is where they thought they, they belonged anyway. And they're Mesoamerican nobility in their own eyes. 
and had a lot to do with the founding of Pachyme, or Casas Grandes, during the Pueblo Fort, the most important Pueblo Fort site. It's not in the Rio Grande. It's not over at Hopi. I mean, and, and there are bigger, actually bigger sites in the Rio Grande and over Hopi, but they're villages. You know, they're, they're farming villages. Uh, this, this is real big, but it's also just packed full of the weirdest stuff you know, like you've ever seen in the Southwest. And it's the most important Pueblo foresight uh, in the Southwest just happens to be in Northern Chihuahua. So we don't talk about it much, at least in terms of, of Pueblo history. Um, This is Dennis Holloway's reconstruction of the excavated portion of, of Pocky May. It was really multiple stories. Uh, he's done one story. And you can see uh, with this reconstruction uh, that the thing looks like it was designed on an Etch-a-Sketch. If you remember Etch-a-Sketches, you know, you go over and up, over and over, up and up. Uh, all on a grid, uh, Charlie Peso, who excavated this thing, called it a Cardinal City because it was so fussy about north, south, east, west. And it's not perfectly you know, aligned on uh, the rooms, uh, perfectly aligned as, as on gra graph paper or something, but they're definitely going for, for cardinal directions. And cardinal directions are enormously important to them. Look at uh, where that red arrow is, that, that arrow is pointing north. And there's that cardinal uh, monument with the four points of the compass. Uh, they didn't have compass, but the four point, you know, the north, south, east, west, cardinal directions. Uh, you can't see it very well, but in a far distance, there's a, and I'll show you another picture of this, a, uh, Effigy mound, who does effigy mounds? Nobody in Southwest. Effigy mound of a horn serpent that run, a football field long and runs north south. There's some other things you can see there. See the I-shaped ball court up above the red arrow. Uh, there's three of them there. Uh, and, and there's not, <laughs> none of those anywhere else in the Southwest. Uh, this is a real Mesoamerican feature along with, okay. And, and Pakime itself was, uh, again, was a capital with a region um, and, and nobles and commoners. There's not much question about that. Okay, Pakime is where the Southwest nobility finally meets real Mesoamerican architecture with, with uh, uh, ball courts and colonnades. There's one colonnade at Chaco uh, they were putting on the show, but they're all over the place in, in public buildings and important buildings at Pakime. Um, but it's also very Pueblo. And the massing of the building is very Pueblo. You don't have stuff like that in Mesoamerica. And, and a lot of the... Uh, ideological stuff that's going on at Pakime sure seems Southwestern, although the horned serpent is certainly Mesoamerican as well. Not feathered serpent, horned serpent. Um, but it's very important to Pueblo people today. Uh, this is the, the effigy mound I was talking about on the left and a horned serpent on a, a Casas Grandes pot. This is Ramos Polychrome. But then in the Northern Rio Grande, you get horned serpent on, in rock art in the upper right. And even today on Pueblo pottery, the Ovanyu, the horned serpent is, is very important, the water serpent. Okay, and then there's T-doors. I like T-doors. They're a hallmark of Four Corners. I mean, you see them at Mesa Verde, you see them at Chaco, yes, places like that. And the rangers will tell you, oh yeah, that's because somebody had a pack on their back. It was easier to get in and out. They're almost always, at least initially, exterior doors, doors to the exterior. And this is obviously a collage of T-doors from a number of different places. Um, uh, they weren't. Uh, the T shape really means something. I don't know what it means. And Pueblo people, you know, that I've asked, either I'm talking or they don't know what it means. But it's indoors, and usually indoors, at least initially, they're exterior doors that are broadcast to the, the world. Yeah, I'm a T door person. I'm a T door kind of guy. But also, like it makes pretty the mug in the upper right, uh, in the handles of those mugs, which are not coffee cups. I mean, there's something special. Uh, yeah, they cut T openings. In the lower right, at Pakime, they had altars. I'll show you another one in a second here. Uh, wooden altar, excuse me, stone altars that are carved with uh, um, T openings there. Uh, this, this whole, yeah, oh, here's, a, here's a nice one. This is the one they took to Mexico City. They left the other one for the museum at, at Casas Grandes. Um, fell site about two feet tall, and it would have been standing upright on that platform in the back. It was two feet tall. Nobody's carrying a pack on their back through that T, all right? <laughs> No human being is going through that T. Uh, something's coming and going through that T, but it, it's a very important ideological uh, feature, not, not a convenience. Okay, so T doors start off in Pueblo II, which is, um, no, I'm forgetting, 900 to 1150. And they're mainly, the ones I know about in UA are mainly in the great houses. And this is, these are these next few maps are schematic, okay? 
you find them in the outlying great houses, those 200 smaller great houses that define Chaco's territory. And I just showed four of them out there in the woods. And then a whole bunch of them at Chaco. And again, they're exterior doors. So when you come into these places, that's what you see. You see this great big T. Um, you know, they're not shy about it. And in Pueblo III, from 1150 to 1300, they get democratized. Uh, they're all over Aztec ruins. But if you go to Mesa Verde, the, the peasants, the commoners have the tea doors now. Uh, they're always exterior, almost always exterior. And at those cliff dwellings, when you came into the canyon, you could look across the canyon and see, oh, that's a tea door place. They're part of that tea door bunch and they'll give me dinner or that part of that tea door bunch, I should probably tiptoe around this place because they don't get, I don't get along with those people all that well. Okay, but then everybody leaves. Like 1280, 1300, all the people that had these tea doors are moving. The uh, elites that had them, I think, moved down to Pakime. The commoners moved to where Pueblos are today, and they give up on tea doors. And uh, where Pueblos are today is the northern half of this map, and there are no tea doors. And other reports, people claim that there's a, a tea, actually, supposedly there's a tea door on the interior room at Acoma, and I've talked to Acoma people about that. They, they don't want to talk about it. <laughs> I think it's there, uh, but it means something, you know, it, it recalls the bad old days from Aztec ruins when things got bad and the people, everybody had to leave. I mean, this, this uh, abandonment of the Four Corners by tens of thousands of people is a pretty traumatic experience. Um, but where tea doors pop up is all over the place in Chihuahua. See that cluster down there in, in Casas Grandes, uh, they use them big ones for the exterior. They have interior tea doors there too, uh, half the doors, and there are many doors in that place. Are tea doors. You had a few of them, it's kind of interesting along what they call the Muggy on Rim to the north, and a few cliff dwellings up there, like Gila Cliff Dwellings and Tonto Cliff Dwellings, which I think were tied into to uh um Bakime, Casas Grandes, as you know, distantly flung uh, outposts. But they're all over the Sierra Madres. I got a chance to go up in the Sierra Madres uh, looking at cliff dwellings and big tea doors that you can see for miles. And you know, and okay, this is at a time when everybody's given up on tea doors up north. So Starts at Chaco, moves to Aztec. Whoops, sorry. Starts Chaco, moves to Aztec, disappears in the Pueblo world, and pops up again where all the elites live, or have, have, have moved to Pakime. Okay. Um, since I can't remember when I started. Oh, yeah, okay. Um, switching to some historic sources now. Conquistadors. It's Juan de Oñate actually colonized New Mexico. Coronado was the first guy through, but he was a flash in the pan. Um, oh, speaking of flashes in the pan, uh, I should point out where Pakime, the last great city that, uh, that I talked about, rose. There was very little there before. Uh, you know, there, there were populations in the, in, the, in the valley, but there was nothing big um, during P Pueblo III before Pakime came in Pueblo IV. So it's like all the rest of these places, it, it, it lasts for one period and then it's gone. So Juan de Oñate shows up about 1600, and we're traveling with him, uh, he comes up the inland route with a big army and, and a whole bunch of colonists and stuff, is uh, Gaspar um, Perez de Viagra, Viagra, excuse me. And, uh, well, Gaspar is a would-be poet, and uh, I don't, I can't handle old Spanish, but people that can say he wasn't much of a poet, but he's a pretty good historian. That, that his, his poetry was lame, but it, his history seems spot on. He was the historian of the of the expedition, published later this long heroic poem about Juan de Onate. And they came by way of Pakime, the moving north. They come by way of Pakime. And the ruins are really impressive. I mean, the Spaniards, Spanish are going, hot dog, this is what we're looking for, is you know, civilizations like this, because this, this place is really impressive. And they asked the local people who built this, because there's nobody there now. And the local people did said, one us. We don't know who these local people were. One us, but we know a story about it, and I'll tell you. And they had two brothers in their story, two heroic brothers of high and noble kings descended, sons of a king, a kin of highest lineage, came out of the north with their courts, their retinues, their soldiers, their, their court, you know, the, the, the people, their kin, uh, you know, not huge group, but, you know, 100 people, maybe something like that. And this is me, I was not saying this, this is me saying that, but he said this, the two heroic brothers of high and noble kings descended, sons of a king, Kin of the highest lineage. This is how it's being recorded by the Spanish. That these guys are nobles and they're traveling south, coming from the north, headed to the south. And they run into a hag, an old woman, who was more than she appeared. Um, she says, "Stop!" And again, this is Yagra. 
They say most certainly she bore a huge, enormous weight, almost in form a tortoise shell set upright of iron, massive and well molded. All right. Um, she says, where I drop this stone, this big stone, brother number one, you're going to build a city. Brother number two, you're going to keep going. Just keep heading south. And so she throws the stone and it lands. And brother number one builds Pakimi, I think, because uh, when treasure hunters in the 1860s, 1860s uh, treasure hunters from the little town of Casas Grandes are out there looking for loot, they find this thing, which is the Casas Grandes meteorite, which is a big meteorite. And it's a, it's a Hummer. Uh, it's one of the bigger ones in North America. Uh, they found it, it was all wrapped in cloth. It was in what they called a temple. Who knows what they mean by that? And by hook and by crook, it's a long, it's an interesting story, but it's, it doesn't reflect well on the United States. It winds up in the Smithsonian, um, where it's treated as a meteorite, right? They saw it up and do it metallurgy and all that kind of stuff on it. But hey, Viagra is there in 1600. Uh, Casas Grandes is gone by 1450. So for 150 years, these people had remembered that there was a meteorite in the middle of this city and then worked it into the story about the hag and all, you know, brothers from the north. Um, makes me believe that the brothers from the north is probably true too. I, you know, they, they, here's a meteorite that they couldn't, you know, that in five yards time, nobody had seen it. I mean, it was buried, it had been for a century. Um, anyway, I give the credence to uh, two noble brothers coming from the south, one, one of which, one, of, one retinue of which stopped and helped found Pakimi. So in 99, I said Chaco Aztec Pakimi. That was the extent of it. And nobody liked any of it. Uh, and these days, they like Chaco Aztec. They still got problems with Pakimi, but there is just so much stuff that's linking in, in its architectural stuff. I don't have time to go into it now. And yeah, there's a lot of parallels uh, between Chaco and, and Pakimi. Uh, that are pretty scary because they don't occur anyplace else except the Aztec. All right. Well, how about after Pocky May? We, we had a run up to Chaco in, in 99. I only took it back to Pueblo 2. You know, and we just went through Basket Maker 3 and Pueblo 1 and as part of this story. What after Pocky May? After Pocky May, my Pueblo 4 ends at 1450. Other people's Pueblo 4, um, you know, it's dated differently, but. For Pueblo 5 after 1450, because that's a watershed in the northern southwest as well. And there's stuff that happens in 1450 with all Paul of Holcom and lots of other stuff. But that's a that's a real uh, historical tip. I think after Pocky May, which is abandoned or is left at 1450, we, where'd they go? Who knows? I mean, who knows where they went? I, I think I know. <laughs> I think I went to Culiacan, which is down south, and more or less on this north-south line. This is old Culiacan, uh, which uh, Nuno de Guzman conquered and destroyed, and then he started uh, the Culiacan of today a little further upstream. Um, it's part of the what's called the Ostalan horizon, and, it, and Culiacan had the distinction of being, you know, the distinction of being the northernmost uh, settlement that the Spaniards thought was a civilized city. You know, beyond that was the Despoblado, and then you start getting into pueblos and stuff like that. And, you know, those aren't cities. Um, but Culiacan was the real deal, according to them, uh, at least until Guzman leveled it and then built it over again. Um, and it attracted the attention of Alexander von Humboldt, who is one of the last real Enlightenment polymaths, uh, one, of the, one of the greatest of the late Enlightenment polymaths. Humboldt, uh, I don't know what you call him, in, in his, when he's wearing his geographer hat, he went on an expedition, he was Prussian. Went on an expedition from wherever he was living at the time, um, France, I don't know, uh, to uh, Northern South America. And he came back by way of Mexico, crossed the, the uh, uh, from the Pacific to the Atlantic by way of Mexico City and spent some time in Mexico City. That's as far north as he got. But he, he spent very productive time there in Mexico City. Because Mexico City is in 1803. It was a very cosmopolitan place. It's still Spanish. This is before the 1810 revolt. Um, and he, he uh, was given access, he was a famous guy already. And so every savant in Mexico City wanted to be his pal. And they gave him access to the Royal Seminary, uh, Royal uh, Institute of Mines, which is like our USGS that had a, a, a huge map collection, including lots of pre-Columbian maps, early explorers maps, all kinds of maps uh, that unfortunately was dispersed during Mexico's troubled years. Uh, there's bits and pieces of it that, that, that turned up. Uh, I won't try and pronounce the 
the bottom collection there, but that was one one of several collections that had many uh, Native American, uh, you know, pre-colonial maps that he got to look at with people leaning over his shoulder because everybody wanted to help them out. And you know, everybody wanted to give them advice too on how it all worked. So when Humboldt, you know, gets done in Mexico City, he goes back to Europe by way of he stops off and sees Tom Jefferson as a pal of his. Um, but in his reports, he has a map of the Southwest. He never got to the Southwest, right? He's building this map from what he saw in the the, the uh, uh, Institute of Mines in Mexico City and what people told him, Mexico City. And the map's pretty good. Uh, the the um, latitudes are good because latitudes are pretty easy in 18, 1800s. Pretty easy to do. The longitudes are whack, wacky because nobody could do longitudes accurately. Um, but when you look at this map, you know it's distorted east-west, but the north-south is pretty good. And you can recognize features and you name stuff like Santa Fe and you know the, the towns along the the, uh, uh, the Rio Grande. Um, and he has callouts about the different Indians that live here and there, and they're they're pretty accurate too. Uh, where this, he locates tribes. And again, he never went here, right? He's getting all this stuff. This is what people in Mexico City, this is, I, I believe you could argue the consensus of the intelligentsia of Mexico City at 1800 is this map about what the Southwest is. He has three call outs. The top one is Chaco with a question mark. It says in French, uh, the first home of the Aztecs. And it, all you can say is it's located south of the San Juan River and east of the Colorado, which that Chaco is south of the San Juan River and east of the Colorado. Of course, some other things are too, like Wapaki, but I'd like to think that's referring to Chaco. That the Spanish knew about Chaco. They certainly, certainly they knew about um, Chaco. They were chasing Indians out there all the time. The second stop for the Aztecs was Casa Grande, Casa Grande in Arizona, one with a big tin roof over it. And that's unambiguous about that. And I'm pretty sure that that was a landmark by that point, where it says second home of the Aztecs. And then Casas Grandes, and again, this is a pretty clear on the map. He's talking about Pachimac. Uh, There's Casas Grandes later renamed Pachimac by the excavator. Um, it says, third home of the Aztecs, from which the, the home of the Aztecs, from which they passed through the Tarahumara to, I will not attempt to pronounce that, but he, th this is a quote off the map that he identifies that word as Culiacan. Okay, what's mean, what does that mean through the Tarahumara? The Tarahumara live in the Sierra Madres, back behind Pakime. And if you're going to go south from Pakime, you're going to go through the Tarahumara country. You're going to have to go over the Sierra Madres, which is a pretty rough country. Um, but that's what, that's what people in Mexico City told on Humboldt um, was the history, that they left Pakime and went to Culiacan. Now, nobody down there knew that all those things are north south of each other. Again, they're not very good on longitude. They're great on latitude, not very good on longitude. They didn't know that. But it turns out, if you follow what von Humboldt is reporting from all his resources in Mexico City, that they leave Pakime to go to Culiacan, bingo, south again, right? It's a long way over, over some rough country. It's a long way from you know all the stuff up in the north, the, the basket maker P1, P2, P3 stuff. It's you know a long way, 400 miles down to the Pocky made, but I'm pretty sure they did it. And it's not, it's not a great technical achievement. It's just a question of taking the time, you know, having a reason, having some reason to take the time to, to get it right. It's, it doesn't require GPS or anything. You know, you can do it someplace I wrote that I could do it with a troop of Boy Scouts and some truck players. Um, the Boy Scouts would be pretty old by the time we get to Pocky made, but it's just a question of, you know, taking the time to, to get it done. They did it that far. I, I don't know, maybe they did the Kuliacon too. So now we're back to the Pecos classification. Every one of these time periods, and there are identifiable time periods. I mean, there's a great agreement about that. The biggest, easily the biggest, some caveats, one caveat. Certainly the most elaborate and weird, I mean, no question about that, starting with you know, great kivas at, at Shibikashi, the earliest great kiva I'm aware, towers at, at uh, um, Blue Mesa and great houses and more great houses and then Paki May with its ball courts and all that stuff. And then, oh, Culiacan. <laughs> I should point out that I've never been to Culiacan. Uh, when I got interested in this stuff, I talked to J. Charles Kelly, who did know that area very well. And he said, uh, Culiacan, you know, really kicks in after 1450, which is right when they leave Paki May. Uh, there are people there before that, but it really kicks in. But Culiacan, uh, I was 
I'm very tempted to go down here and poke around, but that's the capital or the headquarters for the Sinaloa cartel. And for a guy that doesn't speak Spanish very well, it looks like me. That seemed like maybe poking around down there might not be the best way to use my time. Anyway, the biggest, most elaborate, weird, most important, I think you know, I could defend that. Most interesting, and at one point I was compiling the, the amount of citations and stuff on these sites. They're all on the meridian for each one of those time periods. And I would say that those are facts. I mean, it's hard to argue. People haven't argued about that part of it. Um, that yeah, I mean, those are really weird sites, really interesting sites, really huge sites, really important sites. And unique sites in each time period, they're, they're unique for their time period. And they're all sequential, you know, all, the, all the dates work. Okay, <laughs> so what? I mean, what's that all about? What does that mean? Well, I think maybe not going back to the basket maker, but certainly starting with Chaco, you have a political entity with legs that, you know, long lasting political entity that goes on and on and on. Noble families, uh, what, what you might call a house, um, for Levi Strauss's use of the word where he meant like House of Windsor, all right, um, with a deep and abiding interest in North that they carry through time. That's part of, part of their ideology. It's something to do with North. Why North? Well, in my opinion, it's probably because it's the only direction you got, all right? The sun goes back and forth on a yearly cycle. Uh, the moon does its weird stuff on a, on a monthly cycle. Uh, the planets do loop the loops. I mean, you know, nobody can figure out the planets. Um, you know, they 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 really do loop the loops. They're moving all the time. Uh, the stars, the stars in the sky, rotate over the course of the night. Rotate around that one spot that never moves, and that's north. Not necessarily north star. North star did jiggle a little bit over the years, but Pueblo people call this the heart of the sky. And for celestial directions, that's the only one you got. You got north, and then you can use the sun to find east, west, and north, south, and that kind of stuff. Um, but you can, uh, you can use the sun to do it, but the one fixed spot that, that shows you uh, north is that right there that you're looking at. Everybody knew it. They've been living in the countryside for tens of thousands of years. Everybody looked up at the sky. Everybody knew that there's that one, you know, that one direction. And if I was going to start a dynasty and wanted to co-opt a ideological um, dimension that everyone would know, but nobody nobody knew anything about it. They didn't use it, didn't have any economic value to them. I mean, it, it does not, nothing calendrical for a farmer to use. Um, North seems like a pretty good bet. And so, it, you know, it gets baked in and they deal with North and it's opposite South. Again, the, making these movements is not a technical, it's not technically inexplicable at all. I mean, it'd be easy to do, doing them over distances would take time. Uh, doing them accurately, you know, we, we shouldn't expect accuracy, you know, deadly accuracy from people that are doing this with a naked eye and a piece of string and a rock. Um, but if you make many, if many, many measurements are involved, they'd have to be. I, mean, I could explain this if people want to ask me a question later. These north south lines were comprised of many, many different measurements and reestablishing where north is, reestablishing where north is. And if you goof up each time, if it's random, it self corrects. Okay, you have many, many segments that are randomly off one way, and the next one's randomly off the other way, randomly off one way, and you know, so some, unless there's some, some guy's astigmatic or something, so there's a systematic bias, they self-correct, and this is part of the theory of error um, that <laughs> you can go look up in the library. Um, I think that's it. Yeah, that's it. I'll jump back to that rather pretty, that's not Chaco, that's uh, Lowry Great Kiva, but uh, the, the uh, effect is the same. So yeah, I, I think there's some principle which had to be carried by humans over a thousand years that created an archaeology where the uniquely, for each time period, uniquely big, weird, interesting, powerful, important sites are all more or less on this line. Well, that's great, Steve. So yeah, well, that, that's it for me. <laughs> A bunch of uh, great information and everybody that started with us stayed with us so you've captured everyone's attention. I'm not sure what the <laughs> policy is here. I'd be happy to answer questions but Jim uh, can, if somebody can. Yeah I'll, I'll read them to you. Help me out with that. <clears throat> um, Mitzi's asking do you think that they migrated in clans? Uh, no that's that Pueblo story is clans. Uh, noble families had noble families. They had 
a house, a house of Windsor, or whatever, in the Levi Strauss sense. Um, clans are the unit that modern Pueblo history, uh, for some of many of the Pueblos, the people say behind the commoners, they talk about clans. You know, I'm from this clan, and we went here and we went there, and that same clan will show up at other Pueblos. Right. Um, these guys I'm talking about probably didn't work that way. Um, you know, they, they had heredity, heredity and genealogies and stuff like that, but and I'm sure they had terminologies for all that, that if you get into the Mesoamerican literature, it's quite ornate and can be very Baroque, but I'm not sure clan fits in there. And Marilyn's asking, <clears throat> do you have any comment on the horned serpent forward horn and the backward horn? Um, I've seen it both ways in modern Pueblo art, and mostly it's backward. But you can see on, on uh, I won't go all the way back to, there's an image, a small image that you probably wouldn't be able to see on it, but in the Casas Grandes pot, where there's a horned serpent, um, for the horned serpent that, that you're familiar with from the modern Pueblo pottery, you're seeing a silhouette, a, a profile of that beast. But Casas Grandes turns it face on, and the horns are actually like antlers. I mean, you know, on both sides and they stick up. And there are bestiaries in Mesoamerica that has a horned, horned serpent like that, that's like a jackalope. It's got, you know, it's got antlers and it's a serpent. I don't know if that's the same critter or not. Um, at this point, it's a, well, you'd have to ask a Pueblo person if there's significance for how they do it today, when I've seen both, usually backward point. Um, I, I do not know uh, what a Pueblo person would say about that. Mm -hmm. And um, Jolyn Joel, is asking, are there any tea doors in Central Mexico or South America prior or after in New Mexico? And uh, John Diego is, is answering <clears throat> as Palenque. I, that the Maya used T-shaped windows throughout Palenque's yeah. architecture. And it's also that shape is the uh, is a glyph for the word ik, which means breath, wind, or light, and the god of the wind. Uh, it's also so important that it's a day in the sacred calendar. Um, so other than Palenque, I can't think of other sites that do have the T-shaped window. Yeah, Palenque, their windows, and, uh, as far as I know, I mean, I, I've been to Palenque, I haven't crawled all over every building there, obviously. Right. But all the ones that I saw were, yeah, they're were not doors. small, yeah. up in the wall. Not that that negates, you know, the, yes, they're T-shaped. Um, there's a, right now I'm spacing on the a very good article that just came out on this, uh, I'm spacing on the name of the guy who wrote it, but yeah, trying to link the uh, southwestern tea doors to Palenque and, and Maya country. Oh, yeah. There's been discussions about links between Maya, the Maya world and the southwest, say like in Membris, which is contemporary with Chaco, um, not part of Chaco's region, but contemporary with Chaco. Mm -hmm. uh, Membris has uh, finely decorated pottery that shows scenes of people and bugs and birds and stuff. And we like it a lot. Um, Pat Gilman in um, colleagues have tried to link that to the scenes literally on, on the pots of scenes literally showing uh episodes in the Boo. and it's interesting i don't know mm -hmm. the all the macaws and the cacao that come to the southwest they could have come from a number of sources but uh on, on either coast but there's some reason to think that some of that stuff might have come from the maya country or at least the northern you know the, the uh, uh gulf coast stuff um so there, yeah, there might have been you know some hopover stuff going on over over central Mexico between the southwest and, and deep south down there in my country. And then <clears throat> I was really interested when you were showing von Humboldt's map and the, the chocolate with the question marks and the Casa Grande and Casas Grande, and you mentioned that he mentioned that that's where the Aztecs came from. Yeah. And, you know, there's a lot of research or discussion of people 
trying to uh, determine where the Aztecs came from. And, and I, I would just ask in, in that kind of image, <clears throat> are any of those sites, is there a lake with an island nearby that, that might be part of the legend of, be, of Atslan where the Aztecs came from? Um, no, and let me back off here and say that it's my understanding that Aztec just means you came from Aztlan from the north, all right? Oh, so the, Mexica, okay. the Mexica Aztecs are the guys that Cortez bumps into, and they have their stories right. about, they're the guys with the lake and the island, all that sort of stuff. Right, yeah. There are many other groups that came in, you know, from the north, supposedly, who were, if they're Nahua speakers, were also Aztecs. Um, and I, I don't think, I have no idea what Von Humboldt meant by that. Uh, he might have meant, you know, the Mexica, uh, but I'd like to think that it, it just means that there's a groups, you know, important political groups from the north that started off in those places and then headed south. Yeah. And part of part of this domino of, of groups in the po post classic, you know, that, that came in to fill the void after Teotihuacan's collapse. And then Jolyn is asking a question that I think you answered after, in fact, with this very slide that you're still showing. She asked the question about why do the cities end up on due north line before you explained it? Uh, and she comments oh. when the terrain and all is not as a smooth transition to yeah. the well. They couldn't know, since nobody could do longitude, they couldn't know that they were, you know, they couldn't show up at Pakime, for example, and say, no, we want to be due south of Chaco, so let's work on that, guys. They, they, they have to literally line this out, and it has to be a continuous line, um, where basically uh, they're moving south, they're moving away from north, and that's actually interesting for Pueblo people, is that, you know, north is a bad direction, you don't want to go north. I think because that's history where they tried a couple times it didn't work. Um, so they're going the opposite. They're going south, and if you if you do that with you know some precision, if you head south, you head south, and head south, and you're you're taking the time, um, it'll wind up all in north south line. But you know they couldn't do longitude independently. They'd have to physically link, just like the Great North Road linked uh, Chaco with Aztec, physically link it on the ground. Uh, and you know if you do it. With some care, then you're going to wind up with a, one of those maps that I showed you, where everything's on the north-south line. Um, and and the image that you're still showing, why north? That that is the Maya's first creation center, um, and it it came over from the shamanic tradition from Asia and all around, and came down, and and it was later on when the Maya got down to the 14.8 uh, latitude with alignments off of, of a couple of volcanoes down there at Izapa, um, that they discovered two other, and which are now the most important creation centers are the crossroads in the sky of, of the band of the Milky Way and the ecliptic with the pathway of the sun and the moon and the stars, where they have those two crossroads are looking out of the galaxy, uh, sort of around Gemini. And uh, that's where the three stones, the hearth stones of creation are. Or the other one is looking towards the center of the galaxy and the crossroads in the sky. And that's where the whole end of the Maya great age uh, that you know ended on the end of the world on December 21st, 2012. But that was all creation centers that the Maya came up with. But it all started with the original one that, that you're showing. So that. I can understand, uh, you know, how important it, it was for these Kiva people. And so for, for, for Pueblo people today, um, and I don't know about the ideology of the noble families, but for Pueblo people today, they didn't come out of that hole there, the heart of the sky. They came up 
from for from worlds beneath right present world so they come up uh not out of the sky but out of the earth uh, to this world mm -hmm. um let's see uh james jacobs keeps commenting on uh the palenque windows are small and they're windows not doors and in the palace the great palace there's three that align and john Vagel's fascinated with the macaw skeletons found in the southwest sites and he provides a link uh to actual skeleton of a macaw and this was this was along the main trade route uh, that came up through the highlands of Mexico and then went into the south southwest. It, uh, originally, thousands of years ago, it was, it was where they were trading. Uh, well, you know, the, sending up the corn uh, that started in the southwest and then canoe travel through the, uh, the Mississippi Valley, up the Mississippi. But uh, it later turned into elite, elite trade goods that was were, were the cacao that shows up as residue in, in southwestern, uh, you know, ceramic vases or mugs they call them, and the macaw feathers. Uh, also the turquoise, the Aztecs, the later tribes, uh, what they went up at, for the for the uh for the turquoise and i think i think some of those mines are up in utah so they pass through these these sites on the way to get the turquoise do you have patience for one more quick story i think i have i think i have huh hmm well i just took myself off here Well, sorry. Munoz <laughs> um, de Guzman, uh, who was a real thug, uh, he, uh, before Coronado, he mounted an expedition into the Southwest, all right? And he was governor over on the, on the Pacific, on the uh, Gulf Coast. Um, and he knew some native uh, trader who said, oh, you're looking for those cities. I know where those cities are. My father used to go up there. He's a trader, and I know where they are. And Guzman believed this guy uh, enough to you know, get financial backing and mount an expedition, big army and all this stuff. And the guy says, first we go to Culiacan. And Guzman says, okay. And getting to Culiacan, Guzman just destroyed you know, town after town after town. He was really nasty fellow. And to get to Culiacan, and his guide says, now we, now we go north, straight north from here and you'll get to cities. Okay. What's he saying? He's, if you go north from Culiacan, you get to Pakime, you get to Chaco, you get to all those places. They weren't cities at that point, but you know, there's different kinds of times. So you want cities? Oh, here's a city. This doesn't have to be functioning anymore. Well, Guzman follows his advice and takes his army, which has, you know, got horses and carts and cut out, you know, and all this stuff, and bashes into the Sierra Madres for like two months. And where you, know, you can go on foot, like Tarumar are famous for just going up and down mountains, up and down mountains in a straight line. Uh, going, they're, they're really well known for that. Um, you can't take an army up there. And he, but he, he believes this guy and the guy says, just go north from here, follow that North Star or follow, you know, whatever, and you will get to cities. And he, the, the guide whose name we have is somewhere, is I think recounting another trade route that went north from Culiacan. There's the inland trade route that you were talking about. Then there's another one that just went straight north. That's how you, that's how you found your way. Right. It wasn't a road, um, but you just found your way by going north and eventually you'd stumble into Chaco. Uh, Guzman eventually gave up. I think he got recalled to Mexico City and you know had to pay for his sins or something. Uh, he, he never made it, but this is before Coronado. I mean, this this was would have been the first entrada into the Southwest and it was going coming from Culiacan straight north. Hmm. 